So anyway, thank you so much for the introduction. Actually, I know most of you here, whether personally or by name, because I still follow the Zef News. So thank you, especially apart from Christian, Pazlula, and Alma for organizing this today. So first things first. So how did I get here? Maybe some of you would say, yeah, you took the train. Well, apart from taking the train, I really took the train. Um, it's like a full circle moment for me coming back to Zef. And which led me in so many ways. There were some detours to the Ebers Valley University for Sustainable Development. So as Christian mentioned, I did my PhD here starting in 2013 and then finished in 2017. And then I joined Ebers in 2021. So the professorship. And there are, I would say that there are actually common denominators between Ebersvalde and Zef. And this is the surprise that I was telling you till that your photo will pop up. I hope it's fine. <laughs> Similar to you, Henning. Um, so, you know, actually, maybe during my time, transdisciplinarity was still a very new thing. Uh, and But interdisciplinarity was already very much predominant here at Zef. And as you can see here, so not very gender balanced, but <laughs> these are my tutors, or these were my tutors during my time at Zef. And you can see that I have tutors from all departments. And it was very helpful. And I think that I, I owe it to these guys for the work that I've done, As um, apart from Christian. I didn't put your photo there, because <laughs> we have you in person. So. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, so Justice already left. He's now in with Tabby in Switzerland, but I think some of you still know him. But as you can see, the work that I did before and I'm still pursuing now is trying to incorporate all of these different disciplines. And <clears throat> another common denominator with my work in, in ZEF and now in Eberswalde is working with indigenous peoples. So this is the cover photo that you saw earlier. and. Actually, this was taken, if I'm not mistaken, during my PhD when we had the training, GPS training for the community members. And I'm not sure if you will be able to spot me there, but I'm there. And very thankful to the NGO. So this is the NGO. It's called Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program. Maybe you can also Google it later or you can also Google it now if you have your smartphone. There networked uh, with indigenous communities all over Asia. And that's the transdisciplinarity part of my research before, until now, that most of the research problems that I try to tackle actually come from the needs that I hear from their the communities. And this is actually how I became one of Christian's first PhD students because I was part, initially part of Zef A, and then I thought I learned transdisciplinarity here at Zef, and I thought like, why shouldn't I try to apply it? And I totally changed my proposal that led me to be kicked out of Zef A <laughs> to, to Zef C. Um, but it's it's everything is fell into place, I would say, you know, um, and <clears throat> and so with the indigenous uh, peoples. We know that they are coexisting with wildlife, and this is part of the what I will present to you today. So this very cute pangolin, I'm not sure if all of you, any of you have seen it. Who is not familiar with a pangolin or have not seen it? So I guess, that, okay, yeah. Cool, yeah. So you will, we will only find it in, in Asia and Africa. So for species in Asia, for species in Africa. So that was easy to remember, actually, for four. And the issue with them is that they're endangered. And if you know the Convention on International Trade of in Endangered Species, they're in the list or like the, the appendix where it's highly <clears throat> not allowed to, to trade them. But it still happens. And apart from that, they were also one of the actors during COVID. So they were mentioned as the intermediate host of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, 
while bats as the reservoir. So you can see that the pangolin became popular, more pop popular then, not because of um, their cuteness, but because like, oh no, they're, they could be an intermediate host of uh, this SARS. And apart from that, there's a high demand for pangolin, dead or alive. So as you can see, for those who, of you who are familiar, they're known for um, being used, parts of them for like this, the pangolin scales for traditional medicine, or they're also used as food. So bush meat, uh, this one is a mix of pangolin, antelope, and warthog on sale in Eastern Cameroon. And therefore, one of the essential strategies that was put forward during the pandemic, which is, I would say, actually, it's a knee-jerk reaction for mitigating zoonotic risks is for stricter biodiversity conservation. Of course, oh, the pangolin, oh, actually we got the COVID from this wild species, consumption of bats. So we need stricter biodiversity conservation and wildlife uh, protection. But corollary to this, they were also mentioning that there should be restrictions on wildlife use, such as consumption. And there is this controversial correspondence on nature that came out. And it was written by, if I'm not mistaken, someone from Portugal. So coronavirus, why a permanent ban on wildlife, wildlife trade might not work in China. And so they, this is really pertaining to China. And what they actually mentioned here. So they said here, like, this complex issue needs to be managed through initiatives that discourage consumption, such as widely directed education campaigns that aim to discredit and ingrained cultural beliefs. So the others started to think, like, discredit and gain ingrained cultural beliefs. So, and even so, there has been, I wouldn't say exactly that's a backlash, but there were responses to this. So, because it seemed like when you say that it's the cultural beliefs that's in not so many words causing or having caused the pandemic or COVID-19, it's like a condemnation of culture. Well, on the other hand, you also sort of say like, ah, then probably COVID-19 was something like, a, shows that there's a social ecological system in place. But still, um, it has been called Orientalism. You know, you have scientists calling out China, saying like, oh, stop eating pangolin, stop eating the wildlife. And therefore, it becomes necessary to incorporate diverse knowledge and definitely respect historical dynamics and cultural practices. So I actually didn't finish yet the, the book of Edward Said, but at least the parts that I, I read on, on what he mentioned about Orientalism, I think it's, it's a good book for, for us to understand uh, this topic. Might have been written quite some time ago, but still very much relevant today. And so, in terms of historical dynamics, the ecology has already eco the ecology has already thought about this through the shifting baseline syndromes. So this is the illustration of a shifting baseline syndrome. So if you could see in the 1800s, you have a lot more different um, animals, and then in 1950s, a little bit less. Uh, and 2019, not too much. But also, we know that this could be like different generations. So different generations only have a snapshot of during the time that they were alive. So I would say it's something like this. So if I were to go to the beach now, in one part, like uh, maybe a... Uh, one of the tourist areas, marine protected areas in the Philippines where I'm originally from, I would tell my mom, look, ma, there's a lot of fish. So nice. So this is really why tourists should come here and look at the fish. But then my mother would say, not as much during my time. So the shifting baseline actually uh, tells us that there could be 
so much more. Um, there could be this, the, some of them also call it like environmental amnesia because perhaps the earlier generation would have really seen that, okay, this was normal that you have 100 pangolins roaming around. But maybe the generation now would say like, the normal is actually seeing 10 pangolins around. And so there is a lot of data that's lost um, when we look at the timelines or when we look at timelines. Um, and so this is something that I, I thought about. Uh, interconnections through time. So how, when we look at timelines, so how does it actually play into research or into specifically into zoonosis research? So my example here, which is the easiest, uh, I would say, of the so-called tempo coupling, it's something that I coined uh, out of telecoupling. So most likely some of you already heard of the term temp telecoupling, which is, um, distant interactions and so how how tele meaning like far away have co have connections even even if you're far away but then this is about tempo tempo coupling how are things interconnected even through time so the example that i have here so that's also my photo in in mongolia because i just wanted to show you um and this is something that i found out in one of my field visits there so, you know that Mongolia used to be part of, well, they're not, they were not exactly part, but they were uh, like a relative of the um, Russian Federation. And when the fall of the Iron Curtain happened and the socialist system also, uh, there was a dissolution of the social system in Mongolia. And so probably other pundits would say like, wow, nice, now they're, democratic country. Um, but actually, we just didn't um, see that that dissolution of the Mongolian socialist system has far-reaching impacts still felt today, not just on a social level, but also on an ecological level. And so before, they used to do the pastoralism as a socialist collective. And then when the socialist system dissolved, then they had to go through this individual pastoralism. So when they were doing the socialist collective before, they are able to negotiate as a collective. They are able to regulate the number of sheep or goats, etc., cetera, uh, that the land could have. So in terms of carrying capacity, it was regulated. But nowadays, it's a big issue in terms of pasture land use. So there's degradation because everyone just thinking, they're thinking like, okay, uh, I need to earn my money. Uh, and the more um, cashmere goats I have, the, the more money I will have. And also, what's also interesting because during that time, you would think like, yeah, but that's so long ago. How, how could you say that it's affecting um, land degradation in, in Mongolia. And, but even the herders in Mongolia would say, um, we felt that it was a much better life under the socialist system. So with this, it's uh, something that uh, I was thinking like, there are really these interconnections even on a time uh, basis that we probably don't think about and that, you know, even here in Germany, right? So <laughs> Deutsche Welle featured that German's insatiable love affair with potatoes. And that potato is, you know, when I think when I have friends coming here, it's like, okay, what's a traditional German cuisine? So it has something to do with potatoes and that Germans love potatoes. But apparently like the potatoes were coming from the Andes only in the 1600s, but it evolved, right? So we could see that now it's just a given, like potato, ah, Germany. So, and therefore, um, this is something that I was thinking, when we think about time, we and when we think about the issue of zoonosis, we have to think it, about it also from a long-term perspective and not just the snapshot now. 
which is what essentially what happened during COVID. That is like, yeah, this wet market in Wuhan is um, where all of this started. Um, but what led people to establish the wet market for wildlife? What led people to consume wildlife? And what is the historical human wildlife interaction? So were people really eating it before? Similar, you know, to the German case, where were, were pangolins really part of the diets, let's say, of the Chinese? So what happened along the way that led to the status quo? And therefore, this is something that we are trying to explore now. So I don't have the answers because we are trying to find the answers in uh, the project that I have. But we see now the value of involving other disciplines, apart from the transdisciplinary perspective that I mentioned earlier, that we have to really try to see it from our problems, try to see it from the needs of the communities. And so very interested to put to work now together with historians or archaeologists, um, sociologists, and that we probably normally don't meet in our day-to-day -day life. And but this is something that I experienced at Zef before, and something that we also let's say Christian was mentioning that there are less and less students or or I don't know if staff as well eating at the mensa. And but for me during during our time, you know, it was it was the mensa was really full, and it was an opportunity for us from different departments to meet. And that was, I think that was the beauty of, of Zef. Like you have this, maybe you have this break to relax and then suddenly you meet uh, others from the um, other departments that you normally don't meet. So therefore, as I said, I don't have the answers. So the, I'm not sure if any of you also look, had a look at the paper, but uh, the paper that I wrote is sort of the background to the project that we have. And this is the project in Mongolia and the Palawan State University, so in the Philippines, where we want to look at the zoonotic risks associated with wildlife consumption of the tarbagan marmot in Mongolia. So you probably heard of the bubonic plague or sometimes in the news. I don't know if it makes in international news that a Mongolian couple ate marmot meat and died. So this is one of the more well-known, let's say, zoonotic uh, cases. And Palawan highly traded um, Philippine pangolin. And as I always mention to, to the others, I just remembered now, I will, this should be off the record, but I will tell you later, um, that the, one of our reviewers, when we had a review for the project, was mentioning to us that the trading system of the pangolin, whether it's from the Philippines or other parts of Asia and Africa, it's a, a really well-oiled machine already. And so the, the reviewer was saying like, if you don't have a proper security protocol, like I will not recommend your project for funding because it's very risky security-wise that the trading of, of pangolin, as we know, even if it's restricted under the CITES is, is still ongoing, it's a high demand for it. And therefore, this is something that we, under the security protocol that we have, we try our best to have a look uh, how indigenous communities, whether they actually have a role to play, uh, whether how their relationship with the pangolin has been uh, based on their histories and similar to, to marmot. So, we wanted to, to see the other side of the spectrum. So a lot of epidemiologists, a lot of biologists are already working on the biology of zoonosis, let's say. But for us, and this is especially what Volkswagen Foundation put the call out for, that how do we try to minimize the risk of pandemics or zoonosis based on a social cultural perspective. And that's why we have this project. And again, would be 
interested to have your, your views. Maybe if any of you would also like to collaborate, we're very much open to that. And so I would like to leave you um, with this quote. Actually, yesterday was the 126th an um, independence anniversary of the Philippines. So in case you didn't know, we were colonized by Spain for 333 years. And so for 126 years, we have been independent of Spain. But take note, after that's only from Spain. We were also colonized afterwards by, by the US and, and Japan. But this is uh, our national hero. So he said, he who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination. So therefore, this is our call that perhaps, you know, let's try to include historians or the time dimension, at least in, in our research. And this is something that we try to explore in, in our Zoom app project. So therefore, thank you and looking forward to discussing with you guys.